Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Musab Ali Awdal Karim from uh, Sudanese uh, Researchers Foundation. And I'm co-moderating this webinar with Mahad Ahal from University of Khartoum. And we are very pleased to welcome you all to Trend in Africa and uh, SRF webinar series. We in SRF co-organize this webinar series in collaboration with Trend in Africa. Trend in Africa is a non-governmental organization dedicated to science education and science capacity building in Africa. And today we are very excited and delighted to be joined by Robin Williamson. Robin uh, received her PhD in genetics from Harvard Medical School. And then she worked as a deputy editor of the American Journal of uh, Human Genetics. Then she joined the uh, University of Rochester as a research project manager. She also worked uh, as a lecturer at Tennessee Community College. Now uh, Robin is going to talk about uh, genetics and our health. And she's going to start with the basic information about genetics, and then she will move to talk about how change in genes can cause uh, disease. Um, before we get started, I just would like to remind our audience that this webinar is designed to be interactive, so they can ask as many questions as they want by simply typing their uh, questions in the event page on Facebook or uh, in the comment section of this uh, YouTube live streaming. And the speaker will, res will respond to their questions during the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Robin, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. And now I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I'm very honored to be part of this trend SFR, uh, excuse me, SRF webinar series. Um, and I will get started. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. I wanted to start by providing my uh, contact information. So it's on your screen right now, and I will close with this as well. Um, that's my full name, so Robin Williamson. And my um, email address is rw001, that's a one, <laughs> and it's a kind of a strange font, I guess. Uh, so rw001d at yahoo.com. And please feel free at any time to send me any questions or follow up. Um, or if something comes up today that we can't go into discuss discuss uh, too much detail about, I'm happy to follow up later. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, as Masaba said, um, the plan for today is um, to start with some uh, general information about genetics. So I'm going to start with you know, what is DNA and what does it do, and go through a description of chromosomes and DNA and move into genes and proteins, and then talk about mutations and inheritance. Um, from there, we're gonna get into a little bit more detail about how can knowing about genetics affect healthcare. And I provided some um, specific examples. You know, I think there's just a wide range of things that can be affected, um, but I provided some examples about drug design, disease screening, uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and I've also provided some information about CRISPR. Um, this is a really new technology that is kind of taking the uh, field by storm right now. And I don't have a whole lot of detail about it. Um, I can provide some resources if anyone is interested in more detail later, but just trying to talk a little bit about what, why CRISPR is so important to people. Um, my thought right now is that I will be talking for about about an hour, I think, um, based on how long it's taken when I've given similar talks and practiced it myself, um, um, and then to leave some time at the end for questions. And so we'll see how that goes. I'll keep an eye on the clock and make sure to keep close to that. Um, so to get started, I want to talk about what is DNA and what does it do? So we're gonna talk about chromosomes and DNA, genes and proteins, and mutation and inheritance. Um, as a general overview, you know, the human body is made up of many cell types that form different tissues. And uh, one thing that I think is important to remember that all of these cell types, no matter what cell type they are, they all, um, if they're in the same body, they do have the same DNA. But because they are in different tissues, they form different um, functions. And so we have various different types of, of cells in our different types of tissues. 
everything from the epithel epithelial tissue that lines your surfaces of your body to um, the blood cells to your nerve tissue and your connective tissue. And if you get down and look into each of these cells, there are some differences depending on what tissues that they are in. But in general, there's a set of, um, they have, so even though the cells have different functions and structures, in general, they have similar components. And these are called organelles. And so within your cells, you have everything um, from the mitochondria, which is where a lot of your cells produce the energy for your cells, to um, the lysosomes that create um, a place where they can break down um, uh, factors that the cells might come in contact with, to the nucleus. And so a lot of what we're going to focus on today is happening in the nucleus because um, that nucleus is where the DNA gets compacted into structures called chromosomes. Um, and so we're going to, and predominantly what we talk about when we talk about genetics is going to be those chromosomes and the DNA. So to start with a general overview of what that looks like, um, uh, we talk about the fact that people have chromosomes. So remember, each of those chromosomes is, com is a very compact um, structure that contains everyone's DNA. Um, in this case, each person has two versions of 23 chromosomes. And each person inherits one version of each chromosome from their mother and one of each chromosome from their father. So in this figure, you can see that the male on the top left has uh, the 23 uh, uh, pairs of blue chromosomes. Of course, they're not really colored, but that's just for the figure. Um, the woman on the top right has the, the, the pair of the uh, green chromosomes, and then the child ends up with um, a copy from each parent. So when we get down into it, this will help us later on when we start talking about the inheritance of the DNA. This will help us think about how exactly that happens. So let's look a little bit more closely at the DNA itself. So DNA, uh, the, the acronym stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And this is um, kind of talks about a lot about what the actual structure of the molecule is. Um, here we can see that it's made up of phosphates, sugars, and various bases. So on the left, you can see what we call a nucleotide structure. So for each um, component of DNA, there's a sugar. So in the center there, it's a sugar. In this case, in DNA, it's, it's deoxyribonucleic acid. So the, the actual sugar, you may have heard of ribose. In this case, the sugar in DNA is deoxyribose. And that's predominantly where the name comes from. Connected to that sugar is a phosphate group um, that is involved in connecting each of these um, nucleotides together. And then also connected to that sugar is what's called a nitrogenous base. Now these nitrogenous bases, as you can see over on the right, are really what make up the variability within your DNA. And it's kind of incredible if you think about the fact that DNA, there really are only four different bases. So we have uh, cytosine, thymine, guanine, and adenine. And oftentimes when you see um, people talk about DNA, they'll talk about DNA sequences and things like that. This gets shortened to C, T, J, A. And when all of these, um, in the next slide you'll see here, that what ends up happening is these um, nucleotides are strung together through their phosphate groups. So if you start at the top, and you can sort of see there's a phosphate group and that's connected to that, um, a, that uh, structure in the middle is the deoxyribose, then another phosphate group and another deoxyribose and another phosphate group and another deoxyribose. So this ends up being the kind of the, the backbone, they call it, of the DNA. And off of each of those um, deoxyriboses then is a new, um, is a different or a, a variable um, nitrogenous base. So in this case, you see that it's the adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine. And it's really this order of the nucleotides that's, it, that is so important. So as I mentioned, a lot of times when they talk about this, it's the order of the, when people talk about the DNA sequence, what they're talking about is the order of the nucleotides in this strand of DNA. So you might see somewhere, um, again, 
going down um, in the order of the way the bases are organized off of the deoxyribosis that are all connected with their phosphate groups, then you would often see what people put together is a, they'll say this is the strand of DNA. And so you'll see A, G, G, T, T, C, A, G. And so they actually say, okay, here's our strand of DNA. And, um, you know, this is kind of a colorful, pretty picture on the top there that the NIH put together for some of their slides. Um, but oftentimes you'll just see, this is the DNA sequence and it'll just be a string of letters. Um, and uh, it, it, you get used to the fact of what this actually stands for. Okay, that's adenine, that's guanine, that's guanine, that's thymine, that's thymine. So that's the DNA sequence. And it's that DNA sequence that is so important for um, determining um, the, the gene sequence in your body. So um, these, this strand, these sequences of DNA are, um, in this figure, you can see where um, gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four. So they're kind of a, a shortcut figures trying to say, okay, there's a sequence of DNA in that yellow, yellow box um, that we're saying, okay, that's gene one. So a short segment of DNA is considered um, the gene sequence. And for each of those genes, what that DNA is, is that DNA is the, is the instructions to make proteins in the cell. So um, all of your DNA, the DNA itself in general, there are some interesting uh, exceptions, but in general, the DNA in your cells are just instructions. They're instructions so that your cell knows how to make a protein. And then that protein is what does the functions of your cell and, and all of the functions of your body. Uh, basically, the proteins in your body are what are doing all of the activities and functions. Um, so your genes, the, that sequence of those genes is so important because it is what is making the instructions for those proteins. Um, not going to go too much into the detail of exactly how that's happened. I do have plenty of slides with more information about the details of this, um, but um, this is kind of what they call the central dogma of genetics is that DNA is transcribed, and this is the word transcribed that they use, uh, to RNA, which is translated to protein. So, and there are some, uh, plenty of details if you wanna learn more about transcription and translation um, about how that works. But like I said, the whole point of DNA is to provide instructions for making the proteins in your body. So the DNA in, in this, in this um, figure, it's a, little bit abstract, but the top, that larger, darker blue circle is serving as the nucleus. So the DNA stays in the nucleus, the DNA gets transcribed into RNA, and then RNA leaves out into, out, leaves the nucleus out into the rest of the cell, which is called the cytoplasm. And then that RNA serves as the direct message that your cell uses to make a protein. So if you look down at the, um, at the bottom of this, in this figure, what they're showing is this mRNA, again, that's the message that M actually stands for messenger RNA. They, that, that is a copy of the DNA message that was in the nucleus and your cell machinery goes along and reads that message and makes a protein. And in this figure, it says the growing amino acid chain. So the amino acid chain is what is considered the growing protein. So here's another um, figure that talks about that a little bit differently because I just wanted to make sure that that um, the, the again the central dogma and exactly the, the general overview of how that's happening works. So you start with um, your DNA and then that's transcribed into a messenger, messenger RNA which goes out into the cell and gets translated into a protein and um, again this polypeptide is another word for a protein, several amino acids put together, makes a protein. Um, and so this is how the DNA serves as your instructions for the proteins. And I'm just gonna go back again to this, this slide again, because I think that's a good, good um, visual on the fact that each of those genes then um, is the instructions for a different protein in general. So how exactly does that work? You know, that seems like kind of a crazy, um, 
<laughs> and it is pretty complex, but it is kind of cool how it all works out that those instructions in the DNA get made into protein. So to give you a little bit of an overview of that, um, here is what's called the genetic code. And um, what's really in this genetic code is used across all organisms. This is completely universal. And um, the main goal, remember, back up a little bit, is to use this RNA to get trans translated into a protein, into a growing protein. Now, looking at this figure again, the one thing to note, and this, um, this will become, you'll need to notice just for some of the upcoming slides, is um, the messenger RNA, you can see there's the, it's a direct copy of that coding strand of DNA along the top. Now I see the coding strand says A, C, T, G, C, 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 A, T. And then you look at the messenger RNA and you say, well, Robin, it's not really a direct copy. <laughs> it says A, C, U, G, C, 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 A, U. So it's very much, it's very similar, but you have this part that there's a U's instead of T's. So this is important because um, in this RNA copy of the DNA, RNA doesn't have binding. It has a base called uracil. So in this case, um, just so that you would know that the um, when you're dealing with the, the directions when they get to the RNA level, they'll have U's instead of um, T's. So then let's look, let's look forward on this again. So when you're translating that message to a protein, the proteins are made up of what's, what are called amino acids. Now again, there are only four nucleotides in DNA. And again, all of your instructions across all of your body for, for nucleotides, which I just think is incredible. Of course, there's a huge variability in the organization and how long it is, and the, or, you, know, you know, there's enough variability there, but still we're only four. Um, in proteins, there are only 20 amino acids. Um, so 20 amino acids put together in different combinations in different order, different lengths, make all of the proteins in your body. And I just think that that's incredible. Um, so on the right-hand side of this slide, you see the um, list of the amino acids that make up the proteins in your body. So um, the, and again, of course, there are, and there are abbreviations that can make this more confusing. I think most of the slides I've stuck with um, all have the three letter abbreviations. So the amino acid alanine is uh, usually referred to as ALA, arginine is re referred to as ARG. Um, people will say ALA and ARG sometimes. Um, I think in general they stick to the three letters. And then to make it even more confusing, um, if until you get really comfortable with it, each of these has a one letter symbol. Um, which of course, since a whole bunch of them start with A, they can't all have the letter A. So they've got some letters here that don't necessarily align directly. So if you ever see a protein sequence, um, uh, oftentimes it could be in those one letter symbols and that's what that's referring to. Um, but I'm pretty sure I stuck to making sure all the slides here had the three letter abbreviations so that um, it was clear um, what, which, which amino acid we are talking about. Now on the left-hand side of this is the genetic code. And like I said, this is across all organisms. This is used to translate the, um, the instructions to the protein. So as your cellu cellular machinery is reading along, if they see a U, if this machinery um, sees a UUU in the messenger RNA, it'll input a phenylalanine there. So if you see up on the top there, there's that UUU, the top left corner, phenylalanine. Or for example, say it goes down, go all the way to the G column and down to um, almost all the way to the bottom, there's AGG. So say you see AGG, it puts in an arginine. Um, so this code, again, is completely universal and um, provides the instructions of how the cell machinery reads the instructions of the DNA and puts in the different amino acids. Um, so here's just a look. I wanted you to be able to see, okay, what does that, what does the, all these amino acids even mean? Um, so in this case, um, if you can see that there's a, a NH2 and a COOH in all of them along the bottom, 
and the amino and then the, the different branch structures coming up off of that are what make each of those different. So here's just a overview of the structures of the 20 different amino acids. And that's what makes up all the proteins in our bodies, which again, I, I just think is incredible. Um, so to give you a little bit of practice on how this works, and uh, I'm usually able to, to see everyone, so I'll just I'll leave a few moments and, and, and then I'll go on and, and tell you the, next, the answer. Um, is the fact that, so here we have, I wanted you to get a chance of trying to test this out. Um, so that we have a strand of DNA on the left, in you know, AGG, TTC, AGG, CAT, and I've translated that, again, the DNA sequence is exactly the same as that. Um, and so if you were going to use these, this DNA instructions and the genetic code um, on the right there to determine what the amino acid sequence of the protein would be, um, now remember, each of those T's, in order to use this um, code template on the right, would be a U. Um, so I'm just going to be quiet for a few seconds. Um, maybe I'll give 30 seconds. How's that sound? Um, and just if, if you're interested, just see if you can um, put together what you think that protein sequence would be. Okay, so I hope that was enough time. Um, I can't remember now if I left the side. Oh yeah, here we go. So, um, the, so here we put together that the protein sequence for this random chunk of DNA um, would be arginine, phenylalanine, arginine, histine, glutamine, and isoleucine. And so um, I'll just quickly go through the first two, how we got that. So AGG, so if you go over to the so you start at the first position along the, the first column, the third row down is the A, and then you want to do the G column, and AGG is down um, about three quarters of the way down, that's arginine. And then the next one is TTC, which would be UUC here, and that's up in the top left corner for the phenylalanine. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Um, if, at the end, if it doesn't make sense, I'm happy to answer some more questions about that. Um, so this ends up being really important because as these amino acids get put into their order, the way that they are strung together then puts them in proximity to other amino acids, they end up across from other amino acids, and this ends up being how they make a functional 3D protein. So you end up with this long string of amino acids, but none of your proteins are actually a long string. They're all um, folded up and we get they talk about them in terms of the secondary structures that they have and then the tertiary structures as it folds in on each other and the quaternary structures as different chunks of um, proteins interact with each other and form larger groups. So what does this all have to do with inheritance and um, what happens in genetics? And then, like we said, moving on eventually towards talking about disease. So when we talk about a gene mutation or a DNA mutation, what that's actually doing is the fact that you can change just one base, uh, just one nucleotide, just one letter of that DNA sequence. And that can have a big effect on the protein that is instructions for. So in this case, um, you have protein um, X variant one, and then you can see the DNA sequence for variant one. And then there's variant two that has those two nucleotides, those two bases of DNA are different. And instead of a G in the first, so there's an A, and instead of a T, there's an A. Um, and in, in this case, they've actually changed two of the nucleotides, but this can happen just with a single one. And we can talk about thousands of bases, thousands of nucleotides. I'm gonna interchange, by, I should be calling them nucleotides, but we do call them bases as well. So I'll, I'm gonna say that now that if I'm saying bases, I mean, you remember those are the, the nitrogenous bases, the adenine, the thymine, the cytosine, the guanine. Um, so 
just by changing one of those out of thousands, you can completely change the structure and the function of the protein. So in this case, they've sort of they've tried to show that um, what they're trying to show the protein X variant one and protein X variant two. You can see where that that bottom piece is sort of tucked in there differently, and that could you know, and that the top the way it's folded in the top, see how it kind of comes together differently. So just by changing these two nucleotides, these two bases, you've completely altered the way the protein is. Um, and so what does this end up doing? So here's an example of the fact that um, you know, people have blue eyes and people have brown eyes. And so differences in DNA can affect the gene and the protein output. So I'm gonna add, bring in some different um, vocabulary here that I think is important when you're talking about genetics. Um, people talk about someone's genotype. So the genotype is the actual genetic sequence. And then people talk about the phenotype or what the gene does, what the results look like. So in this case, the phenotype would be the blue eyes or the brown eyes. And the genotype is getting at what is that sequence of DNA? Um, so, and here um, we're gonna simplify that. Instead of saying the specific change um, at the DNA level, we're gonna say, okay, across the whole G DNA sequence, there is a capital B version. And that's the sequence of that DNA that makes brown eyes. And they've, they've called it capital B, that's making the brown eyes. And then there's a version of that entire sequence of DNA, which may only have one nucleotide different, that makes blue eyes. Um, so here's an example where you change, change the DNA a little bit, and you end up making a protein that is different enough that instead of having brown eyes, you have blue eyes. So in this case, um, now we're going to move into talking a little bit more about um, how these things are inherited. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce a few more terms here. Um, we're gonna go into this in more detail. So if this is a little bit um, confusing right now, we're gonna talk about it in a little more detail. Um, but remember, we have two copies of each chromosome. So we have two versions, or they'll call them alleles, of each gene. So in this case, say your mom had the, B ver the capital B version of this gene, and your dad had the, the little b version of this gene, then you might have a genotype of the big B and the little b. So then looking under the brown eyes there, you would have the big B and the little b uh, genotype. And in this case, brown eyes are dominant, so you end up with uh, brown eyes even if you have uh, a little b version in there. So um, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, I wanted to give a few more um, examples of how just changing the sequence of a single gene can lead to differences or potential. So one example is hemophilia. Um, in general, you have clotting factors that help that help the blood clot if there's a cut, if you have a cut, help stop bleeding. Um, basically, if you change a single gene, you end up with a protein that doesn't work and you end up with abnormal clotting factors that do not function and can result in uncontrolled bleeding. Um, so in a related note, the PTC is the ability to taste bitter. I don't know if you've ever, I actually used to carry these strips along with me. They can buy these strips that basically taste horrible. They just taste like very, very bitter. But there are some people, and this isn't necessarily a, a disease, but it's a variant in a trait where some people can't taste bitter. And so on the right there is PTC tasting. Um, there's a bitter part of your tongue that contains a protein that basically, if you have one version of it, if your DNA sequence makes one version of the protein, um, on the right there, you can say PTC binds and you're able to taste it. Um, on the left there, you have the, your DNA sequence it's the instructions for the proteins a little bit different so that bitter chemical doesn't bind and you can't taste the bitter. Um, and it's really very fascinating when you have these strips of paper that come, you can buy them from a, a, a laboratory store. Um, so I, for example, can taste it. So if, you, if, you, if I put one of these pieces of paper in my mouth, it's disgusting, it's horrible, I hate it. Um, but my dad cannot taste it. He 
you he just it just tastes like paper to him. Um, so that's a really interesting, um, you know, you give someone kind of thinking you're going to play a little bit of joke on them and they can't actually taste it at all. Um, but it also has to do then do with, you know, he's able to eat more cabbages and things that are very bitter tasting. Um, whereas to me, I can't, I can't eat them. Um, and you know, he doesn't taste th them the same way. So I thought, I just think that's a really interesting thing. Um, also there's a disease called, uh, phenylketonuria. Um, which has to do with breaking down of phenylalanines, one of those amino acids we talked about, um, where in general, we have an enzyme in our bodies that breaks this down. But there are people who, there's a mutation in their DNA, so they, their sequence makes the improper protein, and so that protein that they make doesn't break down phenylalanine. And so it can actually be very toxic um, and harmful to have the phenylalanine build up. And um, you might know of some people who um, there are, they can't eat foods. So you can, um, and avoiding it is pretty difficult. It's in a lot of different foods. Um, here, uh, they, I don't know how, if it's a worldwide thing or not, but they actually have in our, in our food markets, they'll have, they'll sell food specifically without phenylalanine in it. Um, it's a very, very limited variety. It's not, um, too widespread, but there are foods you can buy that companies have made specifically without phenylalanine so that people with this can can eat. Um, they're, they're in general can be just fine as long as they don't eat too much phenylalanine. So um, so that's that's getting at how um, just changing single nucleotide in a single gene can cause diseases or different traits. Um, now it's we're going to talk a little bit more about more complex things, but in general, these single gene traits are quite rare. Quite rare. Um, but there's certainly Huntington's, Huntington disease, cystic fibrosis. These are examples of um, these of diseases that are caused by mutations in a single gene. Um, so I wanted now to kind of move into. Okay, so we keep talking about the fact that. DNA sequence is changed, is mutated. It's, you know, there's something different. So in this image, you see here the original sequence, and then um, since TAACTG, then you have what's called the, they're called the point mutation. So it's TAACCG, that T is now a C, and it's called a point mutation because it just happens at one base, at one point. Um, but, you know, how does this happen? Like, what what is going on there? Um, so there are very, in many cases, that mutations occur spontaneously all of the time. Um, you do a lot of, you have to, every time your cells replicate, you have to replicate your DNA. And during that process, it's, there's a lot of repair mechanisms. There's a lot of uh, uh, self-checking that happens, but mistakes can be made. Um, and <clears throat> so this can cause mutations. Oftentimes, they don't necessarily, you have so much DNA that doesn't necessarily end up in a protein that you could have all of these changes that don't end up making much difference. But if it does, then you might have a problem. There are also changes um, that mutations can happen because of environmental factors like spoke, smoking or chemical exposure. And then as we'll talk about moving forward, um, we're going to talk about the fact that well, often if you if someone has a mutation, then these can be then inherited from generation to generation. And this starts talking about um, the different inheritances that we'll, we'll talk about in more detail. Um, just to give some more examples about how mutations happen. Um, I, I think that this is a couple of different powerful things here. Um, so let's start with on the left. Um, on the left, the normal sequence, the AUG, GCC, TCG, AAA, that, that's the, the normal sequence there. What you call as a silent mutation is the fact that if you go back and look at the genetic code, both GCC and GCT tell your cellular machinery to put an alanine there. So here's a case where maybe a mistake was made in your DNA replication, but the instructions didn't actually change. So the, the, you changed that base from a C to a T, but it didn't matter because the, um, the um, 
the, the, the machinery in your cells still put an alanine there. So it's in the proteins what matters, right? The protein, like we said, is what does the actual functioning in the cell. So when it came down to it, it didn't matter. Um, a nonsense mutation um, is, a, is a situation, and they, these can be quite um, devastating, really. Um, so there are also this, so instead of a TGC there that encodes cysteine, the cellular machinery knows to put cysteine there, there are a few things that are called stop codons. So this TGA, if you go back and look at the genetic code, um, when you're looking at the webinar version of this, if you go back and look at that slide, you'll see that there's things called stop codons. And what this is tells this, this tells the cellular machinery to just stop, you, the protein's done. So say this was at the beginning of the protein, then you had this mutation happen, you wouldn't make the rest of the protein. So you didn't really even change the function of the protein. You, you just didn't even really make the whole thing. Um, and then this, so again, really interesting. You changed one single nucleotide in your DNA and you ruined your instructions. Your instructions are over. Um, the missense mutation is the kind of, um, is a, an example where um, the, you changed one of those bases and it um, ended up making a different, it put a different amino acid in there. So instead of cysteine here, we have arginine. Now here's an example where that might not matter. This could be totally okay for your DNA. The protein, I mean, for the protein, the protein might end up not necessarily needing that cysteine there and the arginine there doesn't interfere with the folding and it ends up totally fine. Or it could be a disaster. Um, and so that's, could, um, could create huge problems with the, pro the way the protein folds. And then we have frame shifts. Well, um, and as you might notice, I, I, we didn't go into too much detail, but we kind of talked about there are this group of three. So you have three nucleotides equals an amino acid. Three nucleotides equals an amino acid. If you lose one, so in this example, you've lost that second C, it's still going to read three at a time. So instead of reading uh, GCC, uh, TGC, you know, you've lost that C. So now it's going to read GCT, GCA, AA. So it's, it's what those little triangles are showing. Like it's, it's still going to read three at a time. So by removing one, you've again, re you've again ruined the left, left, the rest of the instructions. You could end up with a completely different end of your protein, which will have no relevance and no function the way it's supposed to. Similarly, that next um, frame shift is if you add one, Again, it's still going to read three at a time. So you, now you're reading, you're grouping those threes in the wrong way, and you can end up with a whole list of, a whole length of amino acids completely not what they're supposed to be. Um, so I, I just, I like this figure a lot because I think it's really powerful to show the different ways that um, the, um, the nucleotide DNA sequence can matter. And on the right is just an example I wanted to talk about just quickly just show it it's in flies so it's, it might seem a little bit random but here's an example of you've got two versions of what they're calling this w gene and i wanted to just show it because i like the fact so on the left in the in the you know the normal version you end up with the the w plus version gets transcribed and remember and then the rna leaves the nucleus out into the cell and that gets translated into this transport protein. So that's so this little blob on the, the edge of the cell here is. And because of that, pigment cells come in and you end up making red pigment. But here's an example of, on the, on the right-hand side of this, you do, it's a mutated version of the gene. You don't get that RNA, so you don't get that transport protein. So those pigment cells can't even come into the cell, and so they can't make the red pigment. So you end up where usually the flies have red eyes, they have white eyes. I just like these idea, examples of how the protein has changed. You know, the, the function doesn't happen. Um, so let's talk about inheritance. So like this is back to the same picture again, where you know, remember we have two versions of every chromosome and every person inherits one from, version from mom and one version from dad. So because of that, then you have, two, you have two copies of each gene. And again, remember, we're calling each copy of that gene an allele. So the capital A in this case um, is one version and the lowercase a is the other version. So you have allele one and allele two. When you talk about inheritance, 
um, when it, when you get the same cop the same allele for mom and from dad, they say you're homozygous. So on the left there, see that 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 hypothetical joining of those two chromosomes is homozygous for both capital A. So they're homozygous for allele one. And all the way to the right, you see homozygous for little a. And so they're homozygous for allele two. Um, and in the middle, heterozygous uh, is, is what you say when you have one, cop one version, two different versions. So both of those um, potential combinations would be the big A and the little a. So what does this look like in, in when we talk about people actually inheriting things? So in this case, we're gonna first talk about something that's dominant. Um, and we talked about this a little bit with the brown eyes and the blue eyes and we'll talk about it in more detail here. So in this case, the um, blue, now look, look at the looking at the chromosomes, the blue is the dominant allele and the tan is, is the recessive allele. So dominant, stronger than recessive, weaker. So in this case, the father has a dominant version and a, a recessive version. And he has one copy, but that's enough. That's enough for him to be affected by whatever trait this is. The mother has the two um, recessive versions or alleles, and so does not is not affected by this trait or disease. Now their children, this is just a random, you know, children randomly get whichever version ends up happening. They um, the the child on the left got the the uh, blue copy from dad and got the tan copy from mom. Of course, they all get the tan copy from mom because she only has the tan copies. Um, but if you look at the unaffected children, they could get the tan copy from dad or the blue copy from dad. And because the ones that got the blue copy, they end up being affected because it's dominant. Now on the right, you end up with, um, this, is an, this is a recessive trait. So recessive means you need to have both of the bad copies to have to be affected, to have the disease, to have the trait. So in this case, the father and the mother have the um, the blue copy, which is um, what's carrying is the defective version of the protein, and the tan copy, which is the normal version of the protein. And so they're called carriers. They don't actually have the disease because it's recessive. They still have a good version, so they're fine. But if you notice, their their children could potentially have, um, could inherit two bad copies. So the child all the way on the left inherited the two bad copies, ends up being affected because they don't, it's, they don't have a version that's a good version. Now those two children in the middle have a good version and a bad version. So they're not affected, but they're considered carriers because they can still pass the bad version along. Remember, they're not affected because it's recessive. The bad version um, isn't bad enough to make up for the fact that they have a good version. And then all of the way on the right, the unaffected child has two good versions so that they don't have any problems. Um, to talk about another version, another kind of um, inheritance, then we talk about um, there are sex chromosomes. So, um, as you may know, the males have XY sex chromosomes and females have XX. So here's a chromosomal uh, spread from a male. You see down in the bottom right-hand corner, this person has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Now there can be situations where there are genes, well, many situations where there are genes on the X and the Y chromosomes. And in general, we talk about genes that are on the X chromosome. So there are more of them than are on the Y chromosome. So there can be special types of inheritance because as you might realize, if, if a male has something wrong with the X chromosome, they don't have another copy that could be the good copy. So this happens um, quite often. There's different, you know, there's types of mental retardation, there's types of color blindness. Color blindness is a big one where um, the gene that controls someone's ability to see color is on the X chromosome. Um, so if we just look at the, let's just look at the figure on the left here, X-linked recessive carrier mother. 
So the, the father has the normal version on the X, so he can see color just fine. We'll, we'll say this is for color vision. The carrier mother has a good copy, the, the orange copy, and a bad copy, the blue copy. Now she's got a good copy, so she doesn't, she can see color just fine. You know, it's recessive, the bad copy is recessive. If there's a good copy around, you're just fine. So you can see on the left, the unaffected son inherited the Y from dad, because that's the only place he could get the Y from. If it's a son, they have to inherit the Y from the dad. Um, but then inherited the good copy from mom, so he can see color. The unaffected daughter there shows that she inherited um, both good copies, one from mom and one from dad. Now the carrier daughter inherited the um, good copy from dad and the bad copy from mom, but she still can see color because she has a good copy. And remember, it's recessive. Now this is where then the son, this is why um, sons, the affected son here, um, inherited again the Y from dad because that's the only way he could be male. He had to get the Y from dad, but he inherited the bad copy from mom. So this is why if you look at the distribution here, the daughters in general from this mother and father are not going to be colorblind, but 50% of the sons will be because in across the, the odds of this, the 50% will inherit the bad copy from mom. So that's why X-linked genes um, often, uh, X-linked um, diseases often show up in males. Um, so there is also a, a version of inheritance where um, both both versions of the gene show up. And this is an example, um, I think one of the most common examples that I deal with um, would be blood type. So if you have the protein, you have the version of the gene that makes the A allele, you have the protein of the version of the gene that makes the B allele or the O allele. So you have ABO parts of your blood types. Um, then in truth, not, one is not dominant or recessive to the other. So if you see the, the girl on the second from the left, she inherited the A allele from dad and the B allele from mom. One was not dominant to the other. She ends up with the blood type AB. Um, uh, oh, and this is something that happens in cattle as well, um, that you end up with, if you start with um, red cow and in the, in the white cows, that they, when they breed, they end up with the roan cattle. Um, so then that's because of co-dominance. Um, so now I'd like to spend the remaining time. We got about 12 minutes. This might take a little bit longer than 12 minutes, but I think we're in pretty good shape as far as time goes. Um, what, what does this all do? What does this all mean? <laughs> Why does this matter? So how can knowing about genetics affect, affect healthcare? Like I said, I'm going to give some um, examples about drug design and disease screening pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and then CRISPR, if we have enough time at the end to just talk about that briefly, because it is such a popular thing right now and is changing the way, you know, you'll probably be hearing news reports about it on a regular basis moving forward. Um, so one of my favorite examples is getting a little old now, but I just think that this is really very cool. Um, in 2003, researchers determined that people in a family that had hereditary high LDL cholesterol had a mutation in the gene PCSK9. So um, I don't know if you're used to looking at pedigrees like this, but the males in, the, in this pedigree are the squares and the females are the circles. And what they found was they had this um, number of family members that were affected with high cholesterol. And they were able to pinpoint the fact that those people had a mutation in this specific gene. And um, so that was in 2003. It was a pretty exciting thing because, of course, people are constantly worrying about their cholesterol and how to make sure they minimize their risk for heart disease. Um, and in 2015, so it took a while, but in 2015, you know, people were studying, okay, what is this PCSK9 and what does it do? And it turned out what, what people found that it did was that, um, so in this figure, the PCSK9 is kind of that red looking bean bean looking thing um, that bound that binds to the LDL cholesterol and it forms this complex with the LDL receptor that's the LDL R so if you look on this on the right hand side of this figure it binds to this 
brings it as it's being brought into the cell, goes into the lysosome, and the whole thing is degraded. So this this um, not only is it degrading the LDL cholesterol, but it's degrading the receptor for the LDL cholesterol. If you look on the right, the um, the way it usually works is that the little receptor, that little brown uh, U-shaped thing, goes. To, it's at the cover of the. It's at the cell membrane. The LDL binds to it, brings it into the cell. But then only the LDL particle is degraded, and the receptor goes back. So what you might imagine then is that, um, in general, then the receptor keeps bringing the LDL into your cell to get degraded. Now, if people have a mutation and have too much, the activity of the PCSK9 is working too well, you're losing that receptor. And if you lose that receptor, you can't bring the LDL cholesterol into your cell to get rid of it. So you end up with high cholesterol. So based on this fact, and as they learned more about the mechanisms of this, um, companies went ahead and designed, for people, even people who don't have mutations, they said, okay, if we inhibit this PCSK9, then maybe we can minimize or decrease at least the amount of times that that receptor is getting degraded. And if we can keep more of that receptor on our cells, we can bring in more LDL um, into the cells and get those degraded. So that I just that was an example of okay, how did genetics translate into actual healthcare? And there was an example of drug design. Um, another situation that. Um, has been hugely influential in terms of how genetics was um, translated into treating people um, is that uh, in the case of BRCA1, so BRCA1, often they call it BRCA, BRCA1, BRCA2, there are genes that basically, in this image, this pedigree in this figure um, was actually a pedigree from 1866, back when Paul Broca determined that there was something going on. There was, a, there was a lot of breast cancer in this one family. And, um, but later um, in the 90s, uh, people were studying and found that people who had mutations in BRCA1 had a lot of breast cancer or ovarian cancer in their family. Um, and this is, um, I don't know how widespread the story for Angelina Jolie was, but you know she found out that she had mutation in BRCA1 that led to increasing her risk for breast cancer. And she said, okay, see, ya. her mom had already died from cancer. She, she had a mastectomy. She said, I don't wanna worry about this. Let's get rid of everything that could, that could kill me. And so she felt very confident that she was at a high risk because she knew she had mutations in this gene. Um, and just to give you some insight into, okay, what is BRCA1? and this is true for a lot of different cancers, is that BRCA1 protein is a tumor suppressor. And so um, you, cells, cell division, cell replication, everything is very well controlled in your body. Um, and a lot of this is maintained by tumor suppressors. They basically keep things growing in uh, organized fashion. When we have a mutation in one of those tumor suppressors like BRCA1, then your cells can divide and grow out of control. And that's pretty much what cancer is. Whenever you have can, uh, cells growing out of control, um, that's, that's leading to cancer. So there, this is giving you some insight into, okay, what is, this, what is the BRCA1 doing? Um, and I mentioned before, this, uh, the cystic fibrosis is another example of um, a, a disease that's caused by a mutation in a single gene. And so I kind of like this, this figure because, um, so CT, CFTR, that's the protein that's mutated in, in patients with cystic fibrosis. It's a channel protein, it's a chloride channel protein. And different mutations cause different levels of dysfunction. So um, I just, I think this is really interesting. So basically they talk about, um, um, the for number one, there's no protein is made. So here's this G542X. So this is basically saying this is our this, here, this is an example of our, our one letter codes for the amino acid, but that means it went from glycine at position 542 to stop codon. So remember, I said, okay, that's really bad. You, you didn't make the whole protein. Um, so you end up with not getting a, a channel at all, or you have some with no, no traffic, 
or like number four, you have less function or less protein or less stable. So those are all different examples. And now because um, the, um, the cystic fibrosis has been so well studied, they've really been able to um, pinpoint the function, the, the effects of all these different mutations. And so that when people um, get tested, they know what to expect. There are certain drugs that work better for some people, depending on what kind of protein they've made. Um, also, people can screen um, prenatally for things like this and determine, okay, well, how bad, or or if you know, if, if someone knows that they're going to try to have a child with someone, they can screen themselves and screen their partner and figure out, okay, what are our, what are our risks? Can we, can we make sure that, um, are we risking having a child that's going to have cystic fibrosis so they can make those decisions based on what, knowing their genetics? Um, and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is another example. And again, I don't know how widespread this is across the world, but this is something that happens in the United States for sure. Um, that there are, so this is actually a, a picture of a friend of mine's child. Um, so a friend of mine has polycystic kidney disease and was then able to, um, he and his wife worked on, uh, did, did um, uh, some, uh, um, basically uh, made, um, uh, were able to test their embryos to make sure that they um, implanted, they were, they got pregnant with embryos that did not have polycystic kidney disease. So they're basically able to take embryos and test them with, test the genetics of them and determine which ones um, have the disease and which ones don't. So here's another example of how uh, genetics can inform decisions about um, about uh, the health of uh, prenatal health. Um, so all of this that we've been sort of talking about is talking about, again, the diseases that happen in because of a mutation in a single gene. But in general, it's not actually all that easy. <laughs> um, there's plenty of diseases that are caused by mutations in single genes, but most traits are quite complex. And they do not result from mutation in several gene in a, in a single gene. In fact, they have they're they're the result of variants that in across multiple genes, and they have influenced by environmental factors. And all of those things combine to increase the risk of someone to have these problems. They vary from cancer to asthma to diabetes to heart disease, um, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, uh, ulcerative colitis, all sorts of things that, you know, you might hear that people have certain diseases, um, but they're not really necessarily, there might be some prevalence in their family, but it's not directly like, okay, mom had it, dad didn't have it. We look at the, look at the hereditary, the, the heredity of it and the inheritance of it. We can say for sure, oh, this must be because of one, one gene. Um, so what happens in those cases? So in these cases, this is the same figure as before. Um, but I just want to say it in a different context. So in, com in complex traits or diseases, there's a single change in the DNA um, that doesn't cause the trait, but instead it contributes to an increased risk of developing the trait. So again, it's exactly the same thing. You might have a variant, the protein variant one, protein variant two, and variant two doesn't necessarily cause you to have hypertension, high blood pressure, but it might make you a little bit more likely to have it. So what does this end up looking like? Um, um, there, there are, and this is, you know, this is somewhat in the last 10, 20 years that this has been clear that although the majority of the DNA in two different people is the same, there are millions of nucleotides that can vary, uh, vary throughout a population and just cause normal variation. Um, and so this is um, from what's called the HapMap. Um, so each of these RS numbers, RS7901275, all, all of those, they call them SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And, and this is just the arrow across the top there is just standing in for a length of DNA. And every, you know, each triangle, there's a SNP there, there's a SNP there, there's a SNP there. So each SNP, again, single nucleotide polymorphism. So it's a single nucleotide of DNA and polymorphism, polymorph, means it can be present in more than one way. So there could be 45% of the population have an A there and the other 55 have a T there. 
And in general, it doesn't necessarily make a dysfunctional protein. Everybody works just fine. But maybe it has a little bit of a variation. Maybe we don't know what it does. Maybe it means that my hair is a little bit blonder than someone else's. It's, you know, there's a various, various contributing factors. Um, and here, I, you know, I just went through and found some, this is from February 2019, Nature Genetics. You could pr probably go to just about any um, issue of any of the journals these days and find these um, studies. This is brand new, a recent genome-wide association study that identified 64 of these variants that were associated with an increased risk of developing osteoarthritis. Now, I couldn't put the whole table and show all 64 here, but um, I just snipped a little bit of it and I wanted to, to zoom in on some of the numbers. So I just took the first two there and apologize, the resolution isn't very, it doesn't look as good as I had hoped on the actual table on the left, but if you, I did include the, um, citation at the bottom if you want to go to the paper directly, um, that these are, these are just those single nucleotide polymorphisms or you know, these little small changes um, that see, um, in that first one, there's an A in those that they, um, and they're looking at osteoarthritis. So an A increases your risk and a G does not increase your risk. So that's what that very top line is. and um, the weighted effect allele frequency, so pulling over to the, on the left, on the right-hand side there, to that 0.63. So 63% of the population has an A there. That's the, that's the effect allele. That's the one that they think increases your risk of having osteoarthritis. Now the odds ratio, you know, if you have an odds ratio of one, there is no effect. It does not increase your chances. So here, the odds ratio of 1.1, I mean, this is very small that they're saying, we think there is an uh, uh, increases your odds of having osteoarthritis, 1.1. And then this is the 1.07 to 1.13 is the 95% the uh, confidence interval that's just getting down to the statistics of that. And then the P value is how statistically significant they think that 1.1 is. So I just wanted to include this to show you that they have found 64 variants that they think are associated with increase, increasing someone's risk very, very small um, of developing osteoarthritis. So basically in these ideas, it would be thought that you would need to have the risk version of a whole bunch of these, you know, probably way more than even these 64, in addition to additional environmental factors to really end up being someone who develops osteoarthritis. So that's really one of the big things that's been happening in the last 15 years in genetics is people have been, really their methodology for identifying those single gene mutations, like the Huntington's disease, that cystic fibrosis, you get a mutation, you get that disease. The methodology for doing that is pretty well set. But this kind of thing where they're trying to look at these really, these variants that are contributing this really small uh, risk, this is, this is, and it becomes, a uh, factor of numbers. I mean, they're talking, they're looking at thousands of people, comparing thousands of people with osteoarthritis with thousands of people without it, trying to get at these details. And so your statisticians become really, really important. Your data management becomes really, really important. Um, another example, again, this is uh, uh, brand new from Nature Genetics, was looking at um, a variant in this gene, NKX63, that they thought was associated with whether someone could lose weight if they were restricting their diet, if they had dietary intervention. So it's on the third row here, this NKX63, and you look over and you see, these are the p-values. They didn't, they didn't put the odds ratio in this table. Um, and your, your parentheses there, they're, you wanna be less than 0 0.05, that's what it comes down to. And so they decide, we think there's something here for this NKX63, and then notice they compared They've got one data set of 1,166 people and one data set of 789, and they're barely, I mean, there's still the statistical power to get this is, is really, um, they've done it, but, you know, again, large, large population data sets to do this. So they decide that there is something, um, that there's something um, that potentially that's contributing. And so now what they do these days is they do a functional study. Say, well, does that make sense? Is it possible that this NKX63 would be, have some effect on someone's ability to lose weight? 
And here they did a study and, you know, the actual details of this aren't necessarily too important, but they basically what they're showing here is the, um, in, in this figure, it's HGTX because that's the Drosophila version. Again, they've used flies um, to try to do a functional study. And what they basically show is that it affects the, see the, the blue, the height of the blue columns there, it affects triglyceride levels. So they're saying, okay, well, this does seem to have an effect on something that could be related to um, lipid metabolism, which could be related to the fact of these people showing dif differences in how they uh, lose weight. So um, this is very much where the field has been focusing on for the last um, 10, 15 years. So um, I think that, you know, that's pretty much where I wanted to leave um, leave that um, leave the discussion of the inheritance and everything. That's, uh, that's kind of what I was hoping to get to. And then just I'll take a quick minute to talk about um, CRISPR and the fact that the, the reason that CRISPR is being uh, talked about, and I, and I do want to just show this slide at least because at the bottom there, you can see um, the reference to a book um, that I think is really great. Um, I just read it a couple of days ago a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and this Jennifer Duodna is one of the people that, you know, is, is the inventor of this CRISPR methodology. Um, the reason that it's being looked at is it is able to take, um, see on there, these are figures directly out of her book, which I thought were cute because they were, they look like they're hand drawn. Um, the non-functional gene and basically precisely repair it. And this has been something that all the gene therapy approaches really have not been able to do previously. Um, and so they're able to, um, what people have done previously, and this is for GMO agricultural things and things like that, is that they'll do a transgenic approach where they'll introduce a separate gene. And so you can see there on the bottom of the left there, the gene addition, they've introduced say a gene that's going to make a strain of corn resistant to infection by some sort of virus. They've introduced it separately. Whereas instead with CRISPR, they call it, that's why it's called scarless because there's no, there's no sign that it even happened. They're able to change that AT to a GC and maybe make it so that the corn is, is resistant in itself. It doesn't need any external additional genes. Um, so I just wanted to show, to talk about that a little bit. Um, I, uh, let's see, I, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but um, here's an example of in livestock, how they're already been using CRISPR to make um, virus resistant uh, pigs, or they genetically dehorn the cattle so that the, the cattle don't need to be dehorned, which can be pretty traumatic for the cattle. Um, or making um, hyperallergenic eggs. So here's some examples of things that they're already doing. Um, and the, but the controversy then comes in with treating humans. So things like sickle cell anemia lends itself very well to using CRISPR because you can remove those cells from someone, edit, it, edit the mutation with CRISPR, and then put those cells back into the person, and they end up with a their actual fundamental DNA of their cells is different. And so they, it's a way to actually treat and borderline cure that disease. Um, but the controversy you'll be hearing about is whether you wanna do this, what, whether the community wants to be in support of doing this in embryos. And this is what's happening right now. Um, if you heard about this, this is from November 25th, just a couple months ago, where there was the scientist in um, China who did do this, um, they think, I mean, they don't have all the data yet, who did do this with um, two babies. The, 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 the report is that there have been two children whose embryos, they were born from embryos that were edited at the embryo stage. And this has been hugely controversial. The entire community has not been in support of altering um, embryos at the genetic level. Um, in this case, they, um, the, the report is that these children, they edited, they edited the CCR5 as a receptor that is when mutated, because um, there are people who are naturally resistant to HIV infection. And so in this case, he 
the the lab, the the start, the report is that these children um, at the embryo stage, the, that receptor was mutated in those children so that they would not be susceptible to HIV infection, um, which is certainly a notable goal, but you're has that crossed the line into into too much gene editing? So I did want to get this out. I, I wanted to get to these slides because I do think that this is something that you'll likely be hearing more and more about. Um, but with that, I think twelve ten, not too bad. Um, <laughs> I that's that's pretty much um, where I wanted to to end. Um, again, I have some time now for questions and discussion, and I wanted to give my email address again, rw001d at yahoo.com for anyone who has any follow-up after this time. And I am happy to take questions now. And I guess I will stop sharing so I can... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful talk. We really enjoyed it so much. As I mentioned in the beginning, I'm co-moderating this webinar uh, with Mahda Hawi from University of Khartoum and Cynthia from uh, from uh, Sorbonne University, and also in us uh, from uh, University of Jazeera in Sudan. So I don't know if you have some comments or questions before we go to the questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Would you please raise your voice a little bit, Maha? I, I can hear you very well, actually. Oh, Inas, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I can hear you very well. Yeah, I, th I think so, but I'm not so sure I'm going to have a great answer for you. I think that that's one of the limitations is that so much many of these studies are done on old white people in the Amer in the U.S. and in Europe, and so then you end up with even within the, even within the United States, we have populations that we can't we don't have data to support because I, I think the most. Um, I, I think that um, unfortunately, I don't have great guidance other than the fact of that we need to be in more support of these studies involving populations from across the world to to collect that kind of data. Um, I I unfortunately don't have a great information about how um, how because sometimes it's fine. Sometimes using the information is completely relevant, and it won't it won't. It will be completely relevant for your populations, and but sometimes, you know, even within, um, I was just reading a study about the effects of, um, I think it was in in hypertension. You know, they see an effect of a variant only in the African American populations and not in the white populations. And they, in the, the paper, finishes by saying, and we don't know why. <laughs> you know, they they so they you know they there isn't enough information yet um, to make to make conclusions about that. So yeah, I'm sorry, I don't I don't have great great guidance on how to do that. Um, other than we need to make sure we get some better studies. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. 
Okay, wonderful. Okay. okay, so do you, Maha or Cynthia, have any comment or do you want to say anything else? But why I can't hear you well? C can you hear me, Maha? But I don't know why I can't hear anybody. Would you please put the uh, on your uh, voice? Yeah, I see the microphone. Are they muted? I think is that. Uh, okay, let me check if. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can. Uh, yeah, I think um, the potential is huge. You know, previously there were some gene therapies, um, you know, even just 15 years ago, there people would try to do gene therapy by introducing um, a new gene via a virus to someone's cells. And the way that this would happen is they would introduce the DNA and it would incorporate where, somewhere randomly in someone's genome. And the problem would be that um, they ended up with some studies that actually a child died. Um, people, children got cancer because the gene would insert randomly and it might disrupt a tumor suppressor or it could disrupt some other sort of important function. And so the ability to treat um, with that kind of gene therapy has been limited, um, not only by that unpredictability, but also by the technology needed, the skill needed to to do any of the procedure. With this CRISPR technology, some of the really cool advantages of it are that it is it can be done very, really very easily and for very little amount of money. They're, they A lot of the groups that are developing this technology are sharing their materials and sharing their resources. They've, of course, created huge companies which are um, trying to um, um, make money off of it, but there are plenty of groups who are sharing their technology and working with it. Um, and the advantage is that you don't introduce any new um, DNA into someone, you actually fix their own DNA. Um, and so that is very exciting. Um, some of the challenges of it um, are that it's not perfect. There are, you know, they can target the, the location um, so I mentioned the sickle cell anemia, they can target the actual sequence that's mutated very carefully. And that's what one of the very cool strengths of it is. But the problem is that every once in a while it doesn't do that in the right spot. So you do, and they're, they're still working on working, um, fixing those, making sure they've got it right. You know, there's, so there's still some technology development that needs to happen there. Um, in addition, you know, if you, someone has a disease, um, you know, so, it's like cystic fibrosis, for example, you can't, how are they going to, the, the, one of the limitations is how do you fix that? So if you, if you want to take someone's blood cells out and fix them and put them back in, people can sort of do that in a straightforward way. But if you want to fix some channels in people's pancreas and in their lungs, you can't quite, you got to get the, the CRISPR technology to those cells. And so that's something that they're still working on. And, um, and then moving from that, then you become with, end up with the, the, the controversies associated with like, so they have been doing this in animals. They have been changing at the embryo level, the gene, the genes of these animals. And is that really okay? Um, even though they're helping, they're making them less resistant to viruses. They're making them, you know, they're giving them more meat so that when you eat them, you have, you know, there's less um, impact on the environment because the animals are growing larger. So there's definitely positives about this, but you know the questions are becoming now: When do you cross that line? When are we, when are we changing too much? And then similarly, as I mentioned, the controversy of okay, and should we do, be doing this in humans? Should we be creating if we know a baby is going to be born with a genetic disease? 
should we should the field be making that decision to fix it and and it, has that crossed the line and, and it seems like currently most of the people are like whoa we need to slow down we can't be doing this we we have to think about this before um but not all the you know not the entire world is part of those conversations and so it is happening so what does that mean and and can that be used for really quite bad uh, you know, you could end up introducing this into a population that you want, say you want to, because CRISPR can be used to hurt genes too. And so that can be really used for very bad, bad things if you introduce that into a population and, and hurt and hurt all of the babies. I mean, so there are some huge, I mean, there, that's not happening right away, but those are some of the huge things that people are worried about if this technology ends up being used by people who are really trying to hurt other people. So... There, there is a worldwide international uh, committee slash group that's working on putting together international guidance on this. Um, but I don't, I think the issue is that not necessarily all of, it's a worldwide international group, but not all of the countries in the world are participating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, okay, wonderful. So, Maha, Cynthia, are you able to? Okay. You, you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you very okay. well. So, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, your talk. Uh, I enjoyed with the question mm -hmm. of uh, Ines. I have um, a question as well regarding the ethical uh, issues because uh, now we can see the development of uh, DNA testing. Uh, anyone can have access to uh, DNA testing, at least for the inheritance, uh, to find their parents, or and now I think they, they speak about this for uh, to find uh, uh, for a susceptibility of these diseases. Mm -hmm. So, what is your point of view regarding this? Um, uh, companies that uh, want to uh, to do this DNA testing. Um, so you mean things like 23andMe and things like that, yeah, companies yeah. that basically say you're going to be high level, high, high risk for high blood pressure or things like that, or, mm -hmm. um, I think, um, I guess, well, I guess, <laughs> so from my own point of view, I think a lot of it, um, some of it's more clear cut than others. You know, if you find out that you do your genetic testing and you see that you are a carrier for mutation in the gene that causes cystic fibrosis. I think that that can make, help you make really good decisions about having kids and what do you want to make sure you do about that? Um, or just so you know about it. You know, I just think a lot of times helping to know about it. Um, I think a lot of the companies right now um, create a little bit of confusion. I think that they um, oftentimes, you know, there's some fun things like, oh, you have, different kind of earwax or you have, you know, so those sorts of things are not necessarily going to create too much stress in someone's life. But the, the to be able to say you've, you've got this variant and it's going to increase your chance for high blood pressure, um, kind of like, similar to what I talked about, sometimes that variant may be reported in increasing high blood pressure, but it's, but it's so in, incremental, you know, the risk that is raised is so small that people get freaked out about these things. And so, I, I just think it's a without the without someone telling you yes this is the case but it's not really doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have this trait or this disease um, I think it could be kind of dangerous I also think that some of the companies are providing 
the data that they have, I mean, it's such a, a field that's changing all the time. And you might have three papers that said this variant does increase your risk. And there might be nine groups that say it doesn't. But those papers, of course, don't get published because no one publishes a paper when there's not cool results. And so then you've got the companies making, sharing this information based on only half the story. So um, I think a lot of it's kind of cool, but I think a lot of it's a little too early to have been sharing it with people who aren't going to know all of those caveats and who aren't going to understand that this isn't really the answer. Um, so I guess that's kind of what I think. I think it's fun because it's genetics, and of course I like genetics, but if, if you're sharing that with people who don't have a huge background in genetics, and they're basically told, oh, you're going to die of high blood pressure based on this one variant that somebody reported, then that's a problem. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so. I have a question. If I OK, you're yeah, welcome. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, first of all, I want really to thank you about this very informative session. We really enjoyed it thank so much and we cannot be uh, more grateful to that. My question is just following your discussion about that any variant, some, some people can say, well, it's pathogenic and that's why people now are, I think, uh, heading to, to detect functional studies, to just uh, see the validation, especially in, in diseases that so far so many genes were reported. For example, I am working on uh, genetics of epilepsy, and uh, there are so many genes that were reported in genetics of epilepsy. And now we are, uh, as you know, that uh, epilepsy is more now like an oligogenic disease, more than a monogenic disease from so many points of view, according to the recent studies. So we were searching for a model that can have some answers and can adopt to the African population so that it will not be as expensive as the mice models and that something can be applicable. And now we are working on the C. elegans model uh, as okay. the genome of the C. elegans is sharing more than 40% of the human genome. So my question is that uh, the thing that we are thinking of is that epilepsy is an oligogenic disease. And when you are trying to apply two or more genes into the same genome of a worm, then they will have, you will have many difficulties to detect the phenotype that will result out of introducing more than one gene. So my question is that, do you have any relevance in other functional models that can answer the oligogenic question of functional studies? I don't know if I got... Uh, if no, I, I, I understand you and I wish I, I, wish I did. I, I unfortunately, I don't have... Uh, I don't have much information about that at all. Um, have, are you, is CRISPR going to be potentially useful to you at all to be able to introduce multiple? I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know, so I guess I'm just gonna ask you as far as. Yeah, if, this if is what we are trying to do now. We are trying yeah. to apply uh, CRISPR. We, we are not successful yet. So we, we just yeah. started by silencing the genes, like uh, loss of function. But for the CRISPR, we are trying to, to introduce it to the lab. And we are thinking about if you introduced more than one mutation, how can we be able to decipher it at the level of the phenotype? Because it's yeah. not like a straightforward one uh, one introduction uh, method. And uh, this is this is my dilemma. So yeah, yeah no, yeah, no, very complicated. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have much experience in that at all. I'm sorry. I will go to Valeria for her question. We have another. Uh, with us. Okay. I, I am sorry we missed uh, the presentation, so I didn't have time to, uh, to present myself. I'm working with Maha and uh, Cynthia in the Brain Spine Institute. And um, my question actually was, in fact, uh, uh, answered by, uh, because I wanted to, to talk about uh, the select, uh, the way uh, we can select embryos for, which have, uh, you know, to prevent disease, for example. And um, and I wanted to know. Uh, I don't know if you answered that already. It's that um, are, are there uh, the, are there laws in the United States, for example, to prevent uh, people from selecting uh, the embryos, but not for disease reasons, but for other reasons like uh, I don't know. They want uh, children with a girl, uh, you know. Uh, I don't yeah, know if, if it's happening or not. Uh, there, there are, but it's become one of those issues where people don't necessarily always know where the line is. Um, so if it says, oh, I want a girl versus a boy, then people feel pretty good about, okay, well, that's probably, we know that that's not going to be legal. 
but where you know as as new new uh, gene variants are identified, and you might say, okay, well, this one I want this one because it's probably going to be smarter than the other ones. So okay, that's probably going a little too far. This one has polycystic kidney disease. This one doesn't. Okay, that we feel pretty good about. So finding that line is something that people are discussing and struggling with right now, especially now that the ability to make those modifications um, might be happening in the near future. So, yeah. yeah. Thank going, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. We are going okay. uh, to Cynthia back because she will read the, the questions uh, of the audience from the, oh, okay. from the YouTube. So okay. we're... So uh, a lot of people excited mm -hmm. <laughs> on YouTube, and uh, they all say, nice to meet you. It's good uh, to meet you also. So uh, let's see. So uh, Raindrop is asking, um, is, uh, how come the Y chromosome is not vulnerable to inherited diseases compared to the X chromosome? And, uh, okay. uh, uh, and he has a question, like, yeah, is it related to the mitochondrial sequence? Okay, um, so I, I think um, the, the biggest difference between the X chromosome and the Y chromosome is that the Y chromosome is very small and doesn't have all that many genes on it, um, which sometimes leads to funny jokes that we tell that and I don't know if that's across the world or not. They're like, oh, well, you men have the Y chromosome. They don't have very many genes on that. Well, women have two X chromosomes. Clearly, we have more going on, yeah, things like that, um, But which, of course, is not true. Um, but well, um, well, but it is true that the X chromosome has more genes on it. So um, in those cases, um, if a, a more, more functional genes on it, so if you have um, a gene that is mutated on the X chromosome, then you're just more likely to have problems in males than than um, than in females. Um, there are there are some situations. Um, I think there's a, 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 the one example I'm thinking. You know, there's a gene on the Y chromosome that um, has to do with a testosterone receptor, and so if that's mutated, um, then you have trouble uh, with the body responding to testosterone. And yes, that happens um, only if you inherit a Y chromosome, so that only happens in males as well. Um, I think one of the interesting things that happens with X-linked uh, diseases is because of this fact that you can have women carriers not even know it's a problem until they have sons who end up um, end up having it. Whereas with the Y-linked things, the, the fathers would all be affected as well. So um, I, I think one of the reasons that X-linked was kind of a, interesting thing for a while was because of that. Um, the mitochondrial is a bit separate. Um, so the mitochondrial is when you would inherit something from the mother. Um, uh, for those listening who might not know, the, the mitochondria um, are those organelles in the cell that create the cell's energy, but they have a separate circle of DNA. And so in general, the, um, th that, that DNA is inherited only from the mother. And so if you do have a mutation and there's some, some eye diseases, I mean, there's various things, some hearing loss, things like that, that if you inherit the mutation, all, all of the, the mother's offspring, depending on how much of this mitochondrial DNA they get, will inherit the mitochondrial DNA problems. Um, so a little bit different, but. Thank you. <laughs> you want to say something? Yes. Yeah. The mitochondria. Uh, do you know um, uh, studies uh, about uh, why uh, is the mother transmitting the um, only the mother is transmitting the mitochondria and not the father? Or oh, you know? um, yes, yes. Well, I do think I remember seeing something somewhat recently that someone said every once in a while you can get something from the male, but in general the idea has been I need I need to look into that because that has been something somewhat recently. But the general idea is that because the sperm is so small none of the um, organelles other than the nucleus and the DNA are part of the fertilization. And so when you fertilize the egg, the egg ends up with the mitochondria of the mother. So then you're, you're carrying on the mother's mitochondrial DNA because that was what was in the fertilized egg. 
um, and, and it's not coming with the sperm. So you're not getting that brought from the male. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. So let's uh, ask the other questions about- the Yeah, I think uh, Muhammad Sadiq Atayib already um, uh, asked the question about the Chinese scientists. I think you commented on that already. So his okay. question was that uh, Chinese scientists used the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to remove HIV gene. What is your scientific view and ethical view? I think you already commented on that. If you want to emphasize okay. more uh, to, uh, to Muhammad al-Sadiq. Yeah, yeah I, I think that um, right now the, the, the worldview, um, from people who know much more about it than, than I do, the worldview is that we're not ready to start modifying things at the embryo, in human embryos. Um, one, you're making a decision for that embryo that won't be able to input anything and two the, the implications of what can be done with that are are very very broad so um i think right now the idea is that even though of course this person did not they did not mean any harm and these babies will be potentially very uh will benefit from this the the thought right now is that to, that there needs to be some guidelines created before that kind of stuff happens so, so uh, thank you. So, uh, Usam Abu Gab. I don't know if I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to work on my pronunciation. He's <laughs> um, asking a question about uh, ALS. Uh, so, okay. can you tell us about uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and the related potential genetic therapies? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't know very much about ALS. Um, I can look into it more and, and share that later if it's of use to anyone, but I don't, I've, I've never really studied ALS at all, so I'm sorry. So, so I think uh, we came to the, to the end of our questions on this part. We go back to Musab to see if uh, he had more questions on his part. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we don't have any other questions. Uh, so, I just would like to say as a reminder, this webinar will be available in our YouTube channel. So, and also on behalf of uh, SRF and Trend in Africa, I'm very grateful to you all for being here today with us. And thank, thank you so you. much for your time. And uh, at, the end of, at the end of this uh, webinar, as usual, for our uh, audience in Sudan, I would like to say, لما الشهيد ما راح كل النزيف الساح لابسين له نحن وشاح مكتوب عليه عديل فليضغط السفاح حرية سلام وعدالة والصور خيار الشعب Thank you everyone and bye for now Thank you very much